Well, thank you, everybody. And just in as full disclosure is that so um, I am the uh, principal investigator for uh, NIH sponsored what's called uh, the Vaccine Treatment Evaluation Unit. And so for that, I have been the lead investigator here for the AstraZeneca trial for the COVID-19. And we will we'll be starting the um, Moderna uh, pediatric study soon in about the next uh, month. Um, we also worked on the uh, Pfizer vaccine as starting at phase one for adults and then have also participated in the um, pediatric trials. And so some of the stuff where I have more on it, uh, Pfizer is just because that's the information that has been published and the other stuff, unfortunately, a lot of it I've had to pull off of websites and that because there's just not been a lot published yet. So just so that is the background, um, just to say, first of all, why do we need to have COVID-19 vaccines in children? And I really been telling people there's two reasons. One is the direct effect. And that, so when I put this together a couple of weeks ago is that there were listed as 322 children. I just recently saw as now it's over 400 children that have died in the United States from COVID. Um, but the pandemic also has taken a tremendous toll on children's mental and emotional health, their social well-being, and educational experience. Um, that kids are not only not staying level or dropping uh, on their um, test scores compared to kids the year prior to the COVID. But at least as important, maybe more important, is the indirect effect. And for the week ending of 27 May, um, children were 24% of the reported weekly COVID-19 cases, and children only make up about 17% of the population. So now there's an overrepresentation of children uh, as far as having COVID. And that, that translates to over 3.9 million children in the United States have been infected with um, SARS-CoV-2. But you know, we know that children are good spreaders for other respiratory viruses like flu. And there's a lot of studies to show that if you can block um, infections in children, they'll block transmission in adults. And that, um, and especially with flu, is that you vaccinate heavily against flu in children, is that um, you markedly decrease hospitalizations in adults. So there's really those two reasons, I think, that we need to immunize the kids. Next slide. So compared to a, a number of other viral vaccines, you know, how does COVID stack up? So these are other uh, viruses which we vaccinate. So the first column is the different viruses. The next column is the hospitalizations per 100,000. And the, the last column is the deaths per year from that infection. So what you can see is that COVID um, has a hospitalization rate basically equivalent to influenza. Um, the only one that's way a lot higher was rotavirus. And now that we have a a vaccine, the rotavirus uh, uh, hospitalization has gone way down. And actually, a lot of um, hospitals have noticed a significant drop in their census because of uh, those are enteric diseases there, um, Lori, um, and that uh, with the rotavirus being prevented. But then if you look at the deaths per year, is that COVID really way outstrips any of the other uh, diseases for which we routinely vaccinate. It's at least triple even a, a bad flu year and multiple times even a log higher than most of these other uh, vaccine preventable illnesses. So I think you know it shows if you look at historically, we've vaccinated against these others, this is a good reason also why we should add COVID to the, the list of vaccines preventable illnesses. Next slide. So first, just like to go into the adolescent trials. Next slide. And so first, just talk a little bit about the Pfizer-BioNTech um, vaccine, that's, which is an mRNA back vaccine. And so um, initially, the study for Pfizer and the same thing for AstraZeneca, for Moderna, for Johnson & Johnson, they started in adults. Um, and then Pfizer, uh, around uh, October, uh, opened the study up to 16 to 17 year olds and they uh, enrolled approximately 900. Uh, they were randomized one to one vaccine to placebo. Um, and these were incorporated into the main adult study. Uh, just like the adults, the 16 to 17 year olds were given two doses of vaccine three weeks apart and they use a 30 microgram dose. Uh, we collected blood at baseline or one month after the second dose and then local and systemic reactogenicity. So local is where you're getting the shot and systemic your whole body reactogenicity seven days after each dose. And then serious adverse events and unsolicited adverse events were collected for six months after dose one. Um, if the participant had 
a COVID-like illness, um, which can be pretty broad. Um, they're asked to contact us. So we had a lot of visits. So if somebody has a, a sore throat for two days and a runny nose, that that's, counts as a COVID-like illness. So you can imagine the number of times we're getting called about um, illness visits. Next slide. So then um, when everything really looked good with the 16 to 17 year olds, Pfizer then decreased to the 12 to 15 year olds. And that study ended up enrolling 2,260 adolescents, 12 to 15 years of age, again, randomized one-to-one -one vaccine to placebo. And again, giving two doses, three do uh, weeks apart with that same 30 microgram dose. And again, we collected blood one month um, after, uh, at baseline and one month after the second dose and the same uh, collection of adverse events as I uh, described previously. Now, this study was designed to look at immunogenicity. And that, uh, so really to compare the immunogenicity in the 12 to 15 year olds to those in the 16 to 25 year old age group. Um, and again, the participants were asked to contact us if they had COVID like illness. So it was not designed for efficacy. But unfortunately, there was so much COVID in the adolescence, I'll show you in a slide that uh, we were actually able to show the vaccine had efficacy, even this small number of participants. Next slide. So this slide is looking at the geometric mean ratio of the 50% neutralizing titer. So that means how much, um, the, how high of an antibody titer you can get to be able to neutralize 50% of the virus. And that, um, so that in the vaccine group in the 12 to 15 year olds, we had 190 versus 170 in the 16 to 25 year old group. And so the GMR is a geometric mean ratio. So it's, it's the geometric mean titer in the 12 to 15 year olds uh, divided by the geometric mean titer of the 16 to 25 year olds. So when that GMR comes out to 1.76, that means that the, um, the, the titer in the 12 to 15 year olds is 1.76 times higher than it was in the 16 to 25 year olds. And if you even look at the confidence intervals, even the lower bound is 1.47. So the, the, the immunogenicity in the 12 to 15 year olds not only was non-inferior, it was actually superior to the 16 to 25 year olds. Next slide. So this slide then is looking at efficacy. And as I said, that, was, that is not the way the study was designed, but we did collect efficacy it data. And so in the first, uh, uh, first row, it's looking at um, people that had COVID in the uh, seven days after the second dose and whether they hadn't, that these people had no evidence of prior um, COVID. So we did have that blood and nasal swab so we could tell if people had previous um, evidence of COVID. Um, and so that there were, in the, in the vaccine group, there were none uh, versus 16 in a placebo group. And then if you add in, if you had evidence of possible previous COVID, there were still none in the vaccine group and 18 in the placebo group. So the mathematical comes out as 100%, but I don't want to say that because that's just, it's not going to be true. Um, and that the, I would say that the efficacy in the 12 to 15 year olds was equivalent to what it was in the 16 and above, which is in the 90s. So that I would say, take away saying it's excellent. Um, and on these small numbers, we're still showing the efficacy. But to me, the takeaway point there is that we needed 30 to 40,000 adults to be able to show efficacy. We were able to show it in 2200 adolescents. And that just shows you how much disease is out in the adolescents. Next slide. So this is looking at the adverse events in the 12 to 15 year olds versus 16 to 25 year olds in the local. So along the vertical axis is the percentage of people that have the different adverse event. And then across the top is the different adverse events of either redness, swelling or pain at the injection site. And then if you look at each column there, the first column is the 12 to 15 year old and the second column is the 16 to 25 year olds. Basically the takeaway point here is that if you, you can superimpose the, 16, the 12 to 15 year old data on the 16 to 25 year old. So the, the frequency of the adverse events, the, the adverse event itself were identical between the two groups. Um, and that uh, it's, so the left uh, graph is dose one and the right one is dose two. So you, you had basically the same results for both um, doses. Next slide. This is then looking at the systemic adverse events. Um, again, set up the same way, the percentage of participants that had the event and then across the top, the, the different events. Um, and then again, 
the first column is the 12 to 15 year olds, the second column is the 16 to 25 year olds. This is just dose one data. Um, but again, what you can see is that the, the rates in both groups are superimposable and that the most common things are fatigue, headache, and chills. The other thing I think is important is to look at, look at the rate of um, fatigue or rate of headache in the placebo group. It's really not that much different from the um, vaccine group. And a lot of times people say, well, why do you need a, a placebo group? And this is exactly why we need a placebo group because without that, you really can't tell what's attributable to the vaccine alone. So yes, 60% of the vaccine recipients complained of fatigue, but 40% of the placebo recipients complained of fatigue. And, and part of this is just that you're in a vaccine trial. We're asking you every day, do you feel fatigued? Do you have a headache? Do you have chills? Do you have this? And it's things a lot of times that people say, eh, not really. But then when you keep asking them, they say, okay, yeah, I think maybe I'm a little fatigued or whatever. So that's why it really is critical to have the placebos to be able to um, get a good gauge of what's really attributable vaccine. So I didn't show dose two, um, but basically um, the, again, the events were superimposable. And what we saw in the 12 to 15 year olds is the same as we saw in 16 and above is that the frequency of the events in the second dose did increase a bit. Next slide. So then moving on to Moderna, next slide. So Moderna, they um, first had a 12 to 18 year old or under <clears throat> up to 18 years of age. And they called that the teen cove study. Or so for cove is COVID. Um, they had 37 and 32, uh, 3,732 participants and they randomized two to one. So at, for every three people, two got vaccine and one placebo. They re used two doses of vaccine, a hundred microgram dose. They were 28 days apart. So Pfizer, you can't really compare the, the 30 to hundred because it's a little bit different as far as the formulation, but um, they gave doses 21 days apart for Pfizer, Moderna's 28 days apart. Um, Moderna then got a, a nasal swab prior to each vaccine. And again, if they had COVID-like symptoms, and again, like with Pfizer collected blood at baseline and 28 days after the second vaccine, and similar to what I described for Pfizer, Moderna did the same thing for local and systemic AEs and uh, serious adverse events. Next slide. So this is the only thing I could find right now for Moderna for the teen COVID is from their press release about a month ago. Um, and what they stated was that the immunogenicity of the adolescents was non inferior to the phase three study uh, adult comparator group. So that um, basically that the immune response was the same. As, as I showed you before, the, with the um, pediatric for the Pfizer's actually, it was superior, but this one at least met equivalencies, which is all we really wanted to be able to do. Um, after two doses, there were no cases of COVID in the vaccine group versus four cases in the placebo group. And if you use the CDC definition, which is really a very uh, mild definition, if you will, a very uh, easy definition to meet, it's one symptom in a positive PCR. The vaccine efficacy was 93% beginning 14 days after the first dose. So that's really encouraging information. We want everybody to get two doses. We want them to get them on a schedule. Um, but if even if people only got one dose, it, it looks like um, the vaccine has pretty good efficacy after one dose and, and Pfizer really has similar kind of data. It hasn't been, neither of them have been tested specifically for one dose. So we can only kind of glean some information, but it, anyway, it looks like it's starting to show efficacy even after one dose. Um, and their adverse event profile was basically identical to what we saw in Pfizer with the um, injection site pain, the most common local, and then the headache, fatigue, myalgia, and chills, the most common systemic side effects. Next slide. So then moving on to AstraZeneca. So just as far as to make sure people are aware, so the Pfizer and Moderna are the mRNA vaccines, AstraZeneca and Janssen, or Johnson & Johnson, whichever way you want to call it, are the adenoviral vector vaccines. So the AstraZeneca, they have just started a small study. They have six to 17-year-olds um, done being done in England. Um, it's a single blind randomized. So of the 300 participants, 240 will receive the COVID vaccine and 60 will receive the uh, quadrivalent meningococcal vaccine as an active control. Um, that study is currently on hold because of the finding of the, the women um, that had the bleeding in the brain and low um, platelets. And so they're trying to investigate that a little bit further um, before restarting that study. Next slide. And then for Janssen or also Johnson & Johnson, next slide. 
Um, so again, this is um, pulled off of uh, internet and that they're looking at a 12 to 17 year olds uh, and then they'll be added to the phase two adult trial, just similar to what I described with Pfizer. Um, and they'll be looking at the reactogenicity and the immune response of the vaccine at one, two and three month intervals after uh, receiving a dose. Um, so that they said initially they're going to have a small number of adolescents. I don't know what that means, um, 16 to 17 years of age. And then if everything looks good, then they'll be uh, planning to have a younger uh, group and that they will be evaluating two different doses, but we don't know what those are. At least they haven't been announced yet. Next slide. And then Novavax. So Novavax is the protein-based vaccine uh, with a, an adjuvant. And so um, Novavax, they plan to evaluate the efficacy, safety, and immunogenicity of their vaccine in 3,000 participants, again, randomized two to one. Um, they'll have two doses, 21 days apart, and they're gonna have a blinded crossover uh, so that at six months, um, after the vaccine, everyone that got placebo will get vaccine. People got vaccine will get placebo. So that way you can maintain the blind, but you know everybody was vaccinated. Um, and then their outcome measures are basically the same as that I was mentioning with the prior three studies. Uh, next slide. So then moving into younger children. Next slide. So um, this is a, a slide courtesy of Dr. Emily Erbelding. She's the head of uh, DMID, Diagnostic Microbiology and Infectious Diseases, the NIH. And that she asked us to, <clears throat> a group of us to convene to put together some shell protocols. And so um, a group of uh, my colleagues, as far as pediatric infectious diseases, and I was on one of the members of the group, uh, developed uh, kind of shell protocols and that um, I'm not sure that uh, how much the companies looked at them, but what they ended up um, using is almost identical to what we proposed. So I don't know if they used ours or we used theirs or whatever, but this is kind of what most of the companies ended up coming out doing. And that, uh, so in the first place, having an open label, uh, looking at six to 12 year olds and starting with a lower dose than we did in the uh, older, in the adolescents or adults, and then see how that works. And if everything works okay there, then you test that same dose in the younger group as you're testing a higher group dose in the older group. So that you're, um, as you're going up in the dose in the one group, you're going across and testing the previous dose in the younger group. And so that's just a way to be able to move things along a little bit more quickly. Um, and then once uh, decided on the final dose, then having a, a phase two, which observer blind placebo controlled, um, of getting using the optimal dose from that open label part. Next slide. So next slide. So um, the um, Pfizer phase one, two, three pediatric trial, there's gonna be three age groups. They're gonna have five to less than 12 years of age, two to less than five and six months to less than 24 months of age. Um, and just the part one, just as I mentioned to you, there's a plan and that what happened actually, it's already done uh, is 48 for each age range. Uh, 10, 20, and 30 microgram dose will be evaluated. And then part two, the placebo controlled expanded cohort. Um, and they're going to be using two to one randomization. And so the dose that was used um, for the five to uh, 12 year olds is the uh, 20 micrograms, 10 micro, excuse me, 10 micrograms. And then actually for the uh, under five years, uh, we're going to be using three micrograms. Is that uh, that so that uh, was where it says 10, 20, and 30 were evaluated is that we were getting reactogenicity in the kids five to 12 years of age at the 10 and 20 micrograms, uh, not much at 10, but at the 20. So we actually went down to three micrograms and that's the dose is gonna be used for the younger kids. Um, and the plan will be to enroll 2,255 to 11 year olds. I can tell you that that will finish this week. And then the six to 24 month olds are probably gonna be finished in about, mid-July. Next slide. Um, that's all right. It's, so basically what we're looking at here is that, again, the immunobridging. So that we're just really looking at the immunogenicity and see what the immune response in each of the age groups I mentioned there, how it compares to the 16 to 25 year olds. Next slide. And then next slide. So Moderna, they're, so their study, they're going to call it the Kid Cove now. So it was the Teen Cove for the COVID for the adolescents and Kid Cove for those under 12 years of age. Um, they're doing very similar to uh, Pfizer, except they're doing six to less than 12 instead of five to less than 12, but otherwise it's basically the same kind of thing. 
and that they're going to again uh, do the dose ranging that's been completed um, there uh, and they I don't remember the exact dose I think they're gonna use 50 micrograms actually for the um, the kids the six to 12 year olds I don't remember as far as the under six right now but um, found that the 100 micrograms is a, a little much for the six to 12 year olds so decrease the dose to 50 um, and, and that phase two part will start uh, July 27th is when it's scheduled to start right now uh, with a three to one vaccine to placebo randomization and those numbers that I have listed there as far as the numbers in each of those three groups. Next slide. <clears throat> and then Moderna, what they're looking at is the uh, outcomes, the same thing as safety and tolerability and the immune response and if there is sufficient cases efficacy. Next slide. So then just to finish, as far as a few untruths, and that's so the COVID vaccines do not make you infertile. The COVID vaccines do not modify your DNA. So the RNA in the mRNA vaccines do not get into the nucleus. They do not incorporate into, the, uh, into our DNA. The uh, adenoviral vectored vaccines um, are uh, engineered as such as that they're replication incompetent um, and they, so they can't grow. The, the vaccines do not give you a positive test on COVID. Um, they don't magnetize you, even though some of the people that were testifying up in uh, Columbus recently were trying to prove that they magnetize you as they kind of made fools of themselves as the keys fell off their neck and stuff like that. But the, the vaccines do not magnetize you and the vaccines do not give you COVID because this is not, there is not a full COVID virus in the vaccine. Next slide. And I think that might be it. Okay, that's it. So thank you very much. And if there are time for questions, uh, Laurie, I'm happy to take any and that, or if there are questions that people want to email me later, I'm happy to try to answer those for them too. Sure. Well, we can open it up if anybody has any questions they want to ask Dr. Frank. I can monitor the chat box as well, but thank you, Dr. Frank. We're lucky to have you here and be able to do this, this talk for us. We appreciate it.